The 20th century began with the outbreak of the Great War. Advancements in technology, strategy, and weaponry, including toxic gases, the machine gun, and trench warfare, all made their marks on those who experienced their power and brutality. The world saw death and destruction like yet had never seen before. On November 11, 1918, the belligerents put their weapons down, and in June of 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed in France, formally bringing an end to the war. In an attempt to prevent another war of this magnitude, the treaty created the League of Nations, a body of world nations that would convene to discuss and attempt to find nonviolent solutions to global conflicts. At the time, the signing of the treaty was thought to have brought to the world a lasting peace, but the treaty only brought to the world nothing more than a 20-year armistice. Following the war, much of the world, including Canada, experienced the economic boom of the royal trains. Millions of jobs were created, and standards of living rose until Black Tuesday. What started as a stock market crash in New York quickly caused economies around the world to collapse. Within the span of weeks, millions lost their jobs, their homes, and their livelihoods. This would mark the start of the Great Depression. In Germany, what was bad quickly became worse. Millions of Germans were already struggling due to the hyperinflation caused by the treaty imposed reparation payments. The cost of everyday items rose, pushing millions of Germans to the brink of poverty. The nation eventually reached a breaking point. Across the world, new political parties emerged in the wake of the Depression. And the solution to many was taking politics to new extremes. In Germany, this led to the emergence of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party. What was at first dismissed by many as a fringe political group quickly rose in popularity, selling themselves as the only solution to the crisis, and with this rise in popularity, came a rise in anti-Semitism, intolerance, and eventually mass violence. Hitler and the Nazi came to power in 1933, and quickly the anti-Semitic war-mongering agenda began. Gradually, they began to restrict fundamental rights for many citizens, and build up their army. Violating the Treaty of Versailles, and by 1936, they began to march their armies to neighboring nations and took control of their lands, claiming them as their own. They experienced little resistance, as much of the world chose a policy of appeasement to avoid further conflict. This ticking time bomb finally exploded on September 1, 1939, when the Nazis invaded Poland. Both France and England immediately declared war and Canada followed suit nine days later. The world was back at war. 2019 marks the 80th anniversary of the start of the Second World War, and today we commemorate the Canadian men and women who decided to serve their country and help rid the world of dictators and oppressors, ordinary men and women who, despite the trials and tribulation, rose above to help fight for a greater cause. You will hear stories that are as diverse and unique as the individuals who experienced them. These are stories that represent the diversity that did and still does exist in Canada today. Nazi Germany had taken hold of most of Europe. Operation Sea Lion, launched by Nazi High Command, was set to invade Great Britain. Defended by the English Channel and the impressive Royal Navy, the Nazis knew they must take Britain by air. On August 12, 1940, the German Luftwaffe struck attacking the radar stations, bombing the airfields, and engaging British fighters in an attempt to gain air supremacy. By day, the Luftwaffe would provoke the RAF in dogfights, and by night, continual bombing campaigns known as the Blitz terrorized British citizens for almost three months. Close to 43,000 civilians died, and over 140,000 were injured in towns and cities across Britain. The Royal Air Force couldn't fight the Luftwaffe on their own. They called in their allies, including 112 pilots from the Royal Canadian Air Hurricanes, Force, which repulsed the Luftwaffe in the summer of 1940. Number 1 Fighter Squadron became the first RCAF unit to engage enemy planes in battle when it met a formation of German bombers over southern England in August. It shot down three of them and damaged four others with the loss of one pilot and one plane. By mid-October, the squadron had accounted for 31 enemy aircraft destroyed and probably 43 more destroyed or damaged. It lost 16 Hurricanes with all their pilots killed. The Canadians flew with the Royal Air Force during that difficult period, helping defend Britain and its people from the Luftwaffe attacks. The Germans continued their night bombings for nine more months. The attacks became less frequent until they stopped. Great Britain survived the Blitz. In Prime Minister Churchill's famous words, Never in the history of mankind has so much been owed by so many to so few. He was referring to the airmen of the Battle of Britain, 
including the Canadians, who gave their lives to defend against Nazi aggression and tyranny, which marked the turning point of the war. In all, approximately 1.1 million Canadians served in the Canadian Army, Royal Canadian Navy, and Royal Canadian Air Force. Of that, over 3,000 were nursing sisters. These incredible women assessed and treated thousands of patients throughout the war and were responsible for the many lives saved. At first, they worked in hospitals, but eventually these services were needed at the front lines, which meant putting themselves in dangers and exposing themselves to the horrors of war at first hand. These brave and strong women continued to provide not only medical support, but also kept moral up and provided the emotional needs of the Allied soldiers. One exceptional story is the story of Anna May Waters. In May 1940, Anna was appointed to the nursing service of the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, and in October 1941, she left Canada to serve in Hong Kong, her role being to assist the British in defending Hong Kong from enemy invasion. When Hong Kong was surrendered on Christmas Day, 290 Canadians had been killed in the fighting. Another 264 would die over the next four years amid inhumane conditions of Japanese prison of war camps. Hong Kong would become one of Canada's most disastrous losses of the entire war. On August 10, 1942, the hospital she was stationed at was taken over by the Japanese army and the nursing staff were moved to Stanley Camp, which was the prison of war camp on the southern end of Hong Kong Island, threatened by deadly diseases like tuberculosis and malaria. Anna and the other prison of war had to survive their wounds lack of food and medical supplies, and the harsh treatment by the captor. Her experience working in the sanatoriums of the war helped her keep many alive while in captivity. Anna felt she had responsibility for the lives of the men she had come to know in the camp and had a strong determination to care for the suffering around her, which did not waver for the length of her time in the camp. She would go to lengths considering the limited amount of resources she had to help the soldiers remain strong such as making soup in the steel helmet that she found. She took care of the men before herself, through incredible selfish acts, such as feeding them all the soup, even if it meant she didn't eat one bite at that day. She contributed to the survival of some of the prisoners throughout the tuberculosis epidemic in the camp, providing treatment and positivity for the terminally ill. When Anna was repatriated back to Winnipeg on December of 1943, she spent many months gaining back the physical strength and weight that she lost while detained at the Stanley Camp. In 1944, she was presented with the Royal Red Cross, second class. From September 1944 to August 1946, Anna rejoined her unit and served as part of the staff on a ship of TNS, the TTR, a hospital ship that operated in the Atlantic and Pacific. She was discharged in 1950. Anna continued her medical career upon return to civilian life. Her experiences in the Second World War had taught her that if she had the power to help others, it was her duty to do just that. She retired in 1968 to California, where she remained until her death in 1987. Anna dedicated her life to helping others. Her resilience and unwavering ability to care for those who couldn't care for themselves is a testament to her strength and character. We should acknowledge and stand together in awe of the bravery and sacrifice of this amazing woman, and so many more like her. Avant 1939, le seul rôle que les femmes canadiennes avaient durant les guerres était de servir comme infirmiers ou de s'occuper de leur foyer ou ceux des autres. Pour plusieurs années après la Première Guerre mondiale, malgré que les femmes canadiennes ont fait du lobbying auprès du gouvernement canadien pour obtenir le droit de servir dans les forces armées canadiennes, cette force s'est vouée un échec. Mais, quand la Deuxième Guerre mondiale a éclaté, le rôle des femmes a commencé à changer. À travers le pays, des milliers de femmes ont commencé à se joindre au corps d'armée des femmes. Quelques corps connus à cette époque étaient le Corps de réserve de femmes canadiennes et le Service auxiliaire territorial canadien. Même si ces groupes de femmes ne pouvaient pas servir dans la guerre, les corps de femmes ont offert plusieurs courses éducatives à leurs membres, par exemple les courses de spécialisation liées à la guerre, comme des courses pour de décodage en code morse. Après presque deux ans de guerre et plusieurs défaites de l'armée canadienne sur le champ de bataille, le nombre d'hommes qui s'engagent dans le service militaire commence à diminuer rapidement, et le gouvernement de l'époque s'inquiète pour la formation de nouveaux recrues toujours en déclin. 
Alors en août de 1942, le Canada a officiellement créé le Corps d'armée des femmes canadiennes et rend officielle sa création, au début séparée de l'armée canadienne. Mais peu de temps après, en mars de 1942, le corps devient officiellement partie de l'armée canadienne. Pour le reste de la guerre, les corps ont joué des rôles administratifs et professionnels. Les membres des corps n'ont pas vu d'action sur les fronts de bataille en Europe ni sur les mers dans le Pacifique. Mais après la fin de la guerre en 1945, les membres des corps étaient envoyés en Europe pour aider à la reconstruction de l'Europe et d'accomplir d'autres tâches auprès des alliés comme la répartition des prisonniers de guerre. Ensemble, le corps d'armée de femmes canadiennes n'ont pas seulement aidé à animer la nation durant une période difficile, mais sont aussi devenus des modèles pour celles qui les ont suivies. After a successful campaign in Italy in 1943, the opportunity to open up a third front and liberate Northern and Central Europe became a reality. France, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark all suffered under Nazi occupation for nearly five years. By this time, the Nazis' final solution was in full effect. Jews and others deemed undesirable were sent to mass killing centers. Six million Jews were murdered across Europe, many other lives in hiding, praying for the oppression to end. Operation Overlord was planned for June of 1944. The liberation of France would start on the beaches of Normandy. On June 6, known as D-Day, Canadians helped do their part. Despite their soldiers being so young, they proved themselves and captured Juno Beach. Canadians experienced the highest casualty rate with over 13,000 casualties. But they did not hesitate to sacrifice for what was right, to rid Europe of Nazi oppression. Although tales from this campaign are well known across this country, one soldier kept his story in hiding for many years. Lester Brown was one of many black Canadian soldiers to partake in liberating France. Lester was drafted as a rifleman at the age of 23 and was shipped out to Europe in 1944. He landed on Juno Beach on June 6th and was deployed along with his platoon to take Bretville sur Les. Soon after, Lester and one of his comrades were ambushed by the Germans. He was lucky enough to live, but he watched his friend perish. It was scarring for him. Many veterans suffer from PTSD because of what they had to go through, including Lester Brown. He suffered injuries by taking a bullet to the chin and the knee while in Normandy. He only opened up about his wartime experiences during the last years of his life. Lester passed away in 2013. He leaves behind a legacy of sacrifice in the name of a greater good. In the final months of the war, Canadian forces were given the vital task of liberating the Netherlands from Nazi occupation. From September 1944 to April 1945, the first Canadian army fought German forces on the Scheldt Estuary, opening the port of Antwerp and eventually cleared northern and western Netherlands to allow for food and other relief to reach millions of desperate people. By May of 1945, the Nazis surrendered. War had finally ended. Aujourd'hui, plus que 80 ans après le commencement de la guerre la plus disruptive que ce monde n'a jamais connue, on continue de voir de braves soldats canadiens qui luttent pour les mêmes principes, idéaux et libertés que leurs ancêtres durant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Today, we challenge you to consider our responsibility to the memory of Canada's soldiers who fought for freedom. What can each of us do to honor the best of their intentions and actions? How might we work to ensure that the freedoms they fought for, freedom from oppression, from hunger, from persecution, and from hatred, are the freedoms we fight for on behalf of those who need it most? On Remembrance Day, we honor the individuals and their sacrifices that have made the world a safer and more inclusive place. Our hope should be that our generation and future generations to come continue to fight for these same causes, not through armed conflict, but through democratic and peaceful means, through international law, through dialogue, and through education. If, as individuals and collectively, we make these values and ideals a priority, we truly honor those men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice. In honor of the men and women who served Canada and for those who made the ultimate sacrifice, we ask you all to please stand and take a moment of silence. <laughs> 